Well, hey, everybody. How are you guys doing? How are you holding up? This is Heidi St. John. Welcome to the Heidi St. John podcast. Today, my friend, Pastor Phil Hopper, is joining me on the show, and we are going to be answering listener questions. We're going to tackle some pretty important topics, including does God have something to say about immigration? What does God have to say about some of these issues that people are voting on, that uh, people are writing in to me and saying, God doesn't care about this and God doesn't care about that? Phil says God actually has an opinion on a lot of this stuff, and I think you guys are going to be encouraged by that. Also, we're going to touch on the topic of Halloween and on legalism. Uh, This is going to be a great conversation. I always enjoy my conversations with Pastor Phil Hopper, and I think you will too. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Pastor Phil, hey, welcome. Hey, so good to be back, Heidi. So good, it's good to, see to have you. you. You know, the the world's on fire right now, my friend. I mean, we are just a few days now out from a really, really uh, important election. And I don't know if you are watching the news. You may not have seen it out in my neck of the woods. But a couple of days ago, people started setting ballot boxes on fire, dude. Like they're putting uh, huh. they're putting fire bombs in the ballot boxes. Oh, my word. No, I I watched some news, Heidi, but I had not seen that. <laughs> well, it's a true story. It's oh, just, goodness. you know, happening out here. And uh, and I think that the, you know, the net result, mm. you can see people talking about it all over the Internet. Right. First, it starts in Portland. Then mm. it kind of bleeds over into Vancouver. And um, people are like they don't trust it's the difference the between the Midwest and where you live. We we steal each other's <laughs> yard signs out here, okay? That's what we do here. We steal each other's yard signs. We haven't set any ballot boxes on fire yet that I know of. Well, wait till you go into all all uh, mail-in ballots. I think that's part of the problem here. We don't have in-person voting anymore. And so uh, there's just there's the tension. I think this is kind of what I'm getting at. The tension is in the air. And I imagine today's Friday. Uh, that over the weekend that tension is going to grow. We're going to see political candidates make their last pitches. And uh, we saw, I watched actually Trump's appearance at the Madison Square Garden from an airplane the other day because mm. I was watching that on my way home. I don't know if you saw any of that at all. Um, but it really occurs to me that the nation is kind of at the jumping off place. And right before uh, we started recording, I sent you an article from the Christian Post by my friend George Barnes doing a, he just did another survey. He's been doing this for what, 40 years now. And it says as many as 104 million people of faith, including 32 million self-identified Christians who regularly attend church, are unlikely to vote in the upcoming 2024 presidential election on November November 5th, mainly due to lack of interest. Uh, So says research from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. Uh, What do you think about that? Well, as the church goes, so goes the nation, Heidi. We are where we are as a nation because I'm convinced the church is where the church is as a nation, checked out, ambivalent. Uh, I I think it's a really sad commentary, Uh, and I think the Scripture is so very clear. What God expects of every generation of Christians from any place and space in the last 2,000 years is to infiltrate, not isolate. That's what Jesus meant when he said to be the, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Um, why are we letting our light, first of all, not shine, as Jesus said, don't put it under a, you know, you know, you know, the song we used to sing, hide it under a bushel. I don't know any child ever knew what a bushel was, but you know, obviously you <laughs> don't want to hide it. We also heard bushel in a peck and we didn't know we were singing about, but whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Why are, why are we hiding the light? Listen, Jesus said if, uh, if the salt is no longer salty, then it's good for another meat. Here's the point. We don't want to... Uh, be the salt of the earth, which means preserve society from decay. Listen, mm. if we're going to do that, the salt has to leave the salt shaker. Mm. And although we do that in our culture, in our place and time, unlike other Christians before us, it could not have fathomed. Listen, the New Testament was written to Christians that had no constitutional rights. They did not get to elect their government leaders. Uh, they could not have imagined a generation of Christians that actually gets to participate mm. in the governing process and to think, 30 to 100 million Christians are just going to sit it out. It's mind-boggling to mm-hmm. me. Listen, this is more than a civic responsibility, and it is as an American. It is what I'd consider a sacred responsibility. Jesus has told us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Mm-hmm. And in our cultural context of our day, one of the ways we do that is by going to vote. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and certainly if we don't participate, we shouldn't be complaining, right? You know, participate. People have the opportunity. I was telling uh, my son just a little while ago, there was a guy named Dino Rossi who ran for governor here years ago, and uh, he lost by 44 votes. And he said that in the years to come, the most painful things that people said to him after the loss of that election, when they found out how close it was, he said he's heard dozens and dozens of times, oh, man, if I'd known it's going to be that close, I would have come out to vote. Even presidential elections, people have really short memories. I think maybe that's part of the problem. But just uh, yeah, just even with uh, uh, George Bush as he ran against Al Gore. Remember how mm-hmm. close that presidential race was? They're literally counting Chad in Florida. Remember this? Oh, yeah, I do The remember. race is so close. They've actually gone back and hand-counted uh, Florida, which was the swing state at the time, that was going to decide the entire election. I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking about a few hundred votes. Yes. Uh, that would make the entire presidential election outcome sway one way or the other. So... Mm-hmm. Even on a presidential election, we're talking uh, every vote matters. Yeah. Uh, but especially, Heidi, on the local level. You think your vote doesn't matter on the local level? Not only do local governments have a bigger impact on our life than federal outcomes, but this is where just a few hundred votes wins many elections, in some cases, most elections. Yeah. Yep. And here, I mean, we've got, and I know you guys do too, there are very, very important issues on the ballot. A lot of people around the country right now talking about what's going on in the state of of Missouri, where they have really tied, right, an abortion initiative into sort of wrapped it up. It seems to me, maybe you can explain it to me a little better, but they've wrapped it up into a parental rights issue, right? Yeah, the, the, the legislation that Missourians will be voting on, is uh, it's, it's written, I'm convinced, ambiguously enough and ambiguously mm-hmm. on purpose so it can be interpreted later and applied uh, in whatever manner. So uh, it absolutely opens up what amounts to a parental rights issue of abortion on demand. Uh, without parental consent. Here's what's amazing to me. If, if your child goes to public school in the state of Missouri, probably like anywhere else, they can't give your child an aspirin without calling you first. But right. if this legislation passes, they can get an abortion. <laughs> and uh, and mom and dad never even know about it. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, there's a parental rights issue involved here. The legislation positions this all as reproductive rights, mm-hmm. as a reproductive health care issue. Uh, with absolutely no language to minimize who it applies to. So it certainly opens up the possibility of gender-affirming care and various types of uh, transition and surgeries and who knows the outcomes of Mm -hmm. the possibilities. The language certainly opens up the possibility. It could be applied that way. Now, like every other law uh, before we really know exactly how to be applied. It's it's going to be tested in the courts if it should pass. Now, I'm praying it doesn't pass. I think we've got a really good chance mm-hmm. in the state of Missouri of defeating this mm-hmm. legislation. But if it does pass, like everything else, uh, it'll be tested, and then it'll go through the court system. Okay, how are we going to interpret this now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had a question from a listener the other day. I thought I'm going to throw it out at you. Uh, he was saying he was trying to apply a biblical standard, which I was really proud of him. You know, he said, I'm trying to apply a biblical standard when it comes to voting. And he said, you know, I don't see God's word anywhere on the issue of, of parental rights. So I thought this was so interesting. <laughs> he said, I don't see that God's word has anything to say about the fact that parents should be the primary educators for their children or parents should have the primary voice in the life of their kids. And he said, I don't see where God's word has anything to say about uh, borders, like border security, that kind of thing. And I thought, well, first of all, that's not true. And I thought, I'm gonna ask my friend, Pastor Phil, Pastor, does God's word have anything yeah. to say about well, children with, and parents? With, with all due respect to this gentleman, um, man, I don't know what parts of the Bible he's read, or maybe maybe he just hasn't found the right places and passages. But the Bible has a lot to say about that. So Deuteronomy chapter six, I just preached out of this passage Sunday, actually. Uh, going through the series we're in on the National Monument to the Forefathers, called it Hope for Us. You come to the third allegorical figure 
of what amounts to these pillars of civilization, one of which is education. Uh, and education, this allegorical figure on the National Mind of the Forefathers, her eyeballs are looking in. She has no pupils. Why? Because she's looking within. What she's saying by that is, it's my responsibility. I'm not looking to anyone else. Now, not only did our nation's forefathers uh, understand this principle that education begins in the home, and that Come is the on. teaching mm -hmm. of the National Monuments with Forefathers. When it comes to this figure, education, you've got her holding the hand of her child on one side. You've got a picture of an aged man, presumably her father, on the other side. Uh, the teaching here is that every generation has a responsibility to pass on the faith to their children and even their grandchildren. Now, is that biblical? Well, our forefathers certainly believed it was. And they would go to places like Deuteronomy chapter 6, as God is about to send his people into a pagan land. He's reminding them of their responsibility to teach his ways, to teach his commandments, uh, and to pass on the faith to the next generation, their children and their grandchildren. You go to various places uh, through Scripture, uh, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, provoke not your children to anger or rebellion, but raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, so nowhere in Scripture are we told that the schoolhouse, wherever that might be, mm -hmm. is the primary educator of our children. Now, it doesn't mean you have to homeschool, though you're obviously, as well as me, an advocate for home education. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you can still, I'm convinced, in some situations, send your kids and outsource their education. Look, I was not personally going to teach my children any math <laughs> beyond basic adding, subtracting, <laughs> dividing, multiplying. Look, when they put letters and numbers together, I'm out. <laughs> That's right. So, I think you and I agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> There's I'm a reason saying, we write books and we're not you know, doing math you. for a living. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but here's the point. You are still responsible for that child's education. God, God's not giving that, uh, that responsibility to another. Um, so I think it's, it's over and over again in Scripture, Heidi, that uh, that it begins in the in the in the home. It begins mm -hmm. in your house, not not the schoolhouse, not even the church house. Mm -hmm. it begins in your house. Yeah. Uh, well, and I think we abdicated, right? I think one of the one of the issues that's happening with parents today and has been probably going on for a good 25, 30, 40 years is that we've been told that as parents, you know, we give the spiritual formation of our children to their pastor and to their youth pastor. We give the academic formation of our children to a teacher. And what we've done, sadly, in doing that is we've sort of checked out of the process, right? So we, we drop our kids off at the school and we just go, okay, academic thing is done, except for uh, the Bible teaches us that education is not neutral. It's never neutral. And so the job of a pastor, and I, you obviously can speak to this very well, my, my thought has been as a ministry family, you know, we've told our own kids, you don't you don't leave the spiritual formation of your children to a youth pastor, right? They're there to sort of to uh, to bolster what you're doing to encourage your children to walk in righteousness, but it's not your pastor's job to suit you up for war, right? Yeah. We should be in the word for ourselves. Have you noticed sort of a similar thing? Yeah, you look in Deuteronomy six twice, the heart is mentioned twice, the house is mentioned. Here's what he's trying to tell us. Look, the most important part of the human being is not the head, it's the heart. Mm. And the heart is formed in the home. Okay? here The church can teach your children the knowledge of God, but it's in the home that they develop a heart for God. Mm. Uh, your children's youth pastor, uh, the kids' pastor, listen, they get them for an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday if you come every week. Mm -hmm. All right? Not you, get them every, you, you get them every day. Yeah. There's no way a pastor, no matter how effective he might be, can access your child's heart the way you can. And the heart of the human being is the heart of the problem. Uh, it, it's shaping that heart uh, that you get to do. You shepherd that child's heart. And that can only really happen in the home. It simply cannot happen at church, no matter how faithful you are to attend. And, and mm -hmm. most faithful church members no longer attend nearly like they used to. Oh, so it's true. Yeah, yeah, instead of 52 Sundays a, a year, whatever it might be, now we're down to, you know, do the math. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just no, there's no way anyone can become a 
surrogate for you. The church is not meant to be a replacement, simply a reinforcement. We're here to partner with families and parents to disciple their children and love Jesus. And I would suggest that's, that's true of the math teacher yep. or the, the child, uh, you know, going to a tutor to learn to read or whatever it might be. Hey, man, my kids, my, I, my kids have all gone to tutors when it comes to math. You know, Sailor's doing algebra right now. And I guarantee you, uh, Heidi St. John's not teaching algebra to Sailor St. John because it's just not my thing. I don't like it. I feel you know? your pain. I will do I history with pain. her every day of the week and twice on Sunday. I don't mind teaching her to write. I will yeah. diagram sentences. But please don't make me put numbers and letters together. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you're checked out of the process. Absolutely not. You still no, want to see her progress, and you still want to know how that who's teacher— Who's teaching her. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how are they using the pulpit you've given them? Well, that's good. Uh, because every teacher has a pulpit of their own. And I'll never forget a parent-teacher conference. I think my son was a sophomore in high school. He came home one day from English class and announced his English teacher— facilitated a discussion instead of teaching math or I should say English the English class uh, they spent the entire hour talking about LGBTQ issues Wow so here here's the point by this time they're going to public school uh, we had homeschooled up through um, grade school um, now they're going to public school he's going to English to learn English so my question to her was, why is his English teacher not teaching English? Why are you facilitating right. a discussion on LGBTQ issues? And she was taken off guard. I doubt anybody ever asked her that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it was there that I told her I send him to school, in this case, to learn English. And I would suggest that when it comes to human sexuality and matters of morality, that that is best saved for his family mm-hmm. and his faith. Mm-hmm. Now, did it make a difference? Probably not. But if more parents would take that kind of responsibility and oversight, it might start to. Yeah. Yeah. Turns out it matters. And it matters that we know. I mean, it goes back to what you're saying a minute ago. We can't just drop our kids off and then check out of the process. Uh, We need to know who's teaching our children because guess what? They bring a worldview with them. Right. They see the world through a particular lens and we need to know what that is. If we don't educate our kids, the world will indoctrinate our kids. Boy, so true. This is what it comes down to. The the indoctrination is everywhere Mm -hmm. from the public school system, uh, public school classrooms to movies, to music, social media. Mm -hmm. social media influence is it's indoctrination Mm -hmm. so it's our job whether you're homeschooling to do some home education Mm -hmm. daily this is what Deuteronomy 6 tells us daily when you lie down when you rise up when you're walking by the way when you're sitting down to dinner these are the moments just doing life with your children that it happens that that they begin to assimilate the faith into their life as you help them navigate the challenges they're facing in life, the situations they're facing in life, as you're helping them navigate. Here, our children are not asking, uh, is Christianity true? They're asking, does Christianity work? Mm. See, they can come to church and find out it's true and learn all the right theology, but we wonder why, in some cases, they walk away from the faith and they don't stay. Mm-hmm. Because they didn't grow up to learn, hey, it worked. This is a postmodern thinker. They're being raised in a postmodern society. In postmodernism, something can be factual, even if it's not fully truthful. Mm-hmm. This is why you can have your truth, I can have mine. So these are the days that it's not enough to prove something is true. For a postmodern thinker, they're asking, does it work? Is it, if it works, it must be true. It's our job as parents to show them, look, Jesus is more than true. Jesus works. Mm-hmm. He changed my life. Here's how he works in this situation, now in your life. Mm-hmm. No one can do that better than a parent. No one can do that better than you. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, are we, are we going to take that, that mandate from God seriously? And it, and it is exhausting. I, mean, I think it's fair to say you know this. You've raised children. Uh, it's exhausting. And I notice, you know, it's so much easier for me to pick up my phone every day uh, than it is to pick up my Bible. And that's the truth. And I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And still, you know, the battles that we face every day as Christians are lordship issues, right? Is, it, is, is Jesus the Lord of my home? 
And if he is, am I going to uh, train up my children? And and it gets exhausting. I mean, we mm. should just be honest yeah. about Our it. Our kids it's, are worth the cost. Yes. They're worth the cost. They're worth the cost. Yeah. It's a battle worth fighting. Yeah. So, um, yeah. 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 Absolutely true. The, sh- the short answer to the question, does the Bible have anything to say? Yes. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. They, the other one was the Bible didn't have any, any, anything to say about border security. Right. Well, let me speak into that. Romans 13, 1 through 5 tells us the institution of human government comes from God. Three institutions God gave society for the good order health of society. You have the family, you have the church, you have human government, civil authority. Where there is no civil authority, you have anarchy. Haiti is an example this mm. year. The government collapsed, and with the government collapse, you have instantly anarchy, and the gangs are now running the country. So God knew, in Genesis 9, he tells Noah, getting off the ark, before the flood, it was pure tribalism, survival of the fittest, strong praying on the weak, it was anarchy. No human civilizations, not civilized, law of the jungle. He says, we're not going to do this again. Noah's getting off the ark, he institutes civil authority. He delegates his authority to human beings to execute judgment and justice on his behalf. He says these words to Noah, from now on, if any man sheds man's blood, by man his blood will be shed. Mm -hmm. So he's instituting here civil authority to execute his judgment upon capital offenders. Now Paul doubles down on that actually goes deeper into that you read romans 13 1 through 5 it's very very clear the number one responsibility of government and biblically the only responsibility of government is to protect its citizens from enemies from without and violent perpetrators from within those who would steal or take away the freedom the prosperity the peace of society Border security very much is a biblical issue. Our government is derelict in its duty when it does not secure our borders, potentially from enemies from without that are now coming in and we don't even know who they are or or where they're at. The number one responsibility of government. Uh, And our government has taken on a lot of responsibility that, biblically speaking, it never should have. Mm-hmm. Uh, biblically speaking, um, they certainly were under no biblical mandate too. But the one thing God tells the government to do, protect its citizens from enemies from without and violent perpetrators from within. Border mm-hmm. security certainly falls uh, into that category. Yeah, it's so true. And and I think we can go back to the history of our country. The federal government, as you alluded to in a minute, a moment ago, is wildly outside of the original intent that the founding fathers had for it. They were limited government guys. Right. And they were like, listen, the federal government has, you know, just a couple of jobs. It is to provide for the national defense to make sure that our borders are secure. Without a border, you don't have a nation. Uh, borders are important. I, I I seem to think, I mean, I could be wrong, Pastor Phil, but I feel like God was a, f- a fan of walls uh, in the Bible. Well, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I, I I think that was uh, the Lord's idea. Thomas Jefferson said this, Heidi, any government powerful enough to do everything for you is powerful enough to take everything from you. Boy, so true. So we now live in a society that has a unbiblical view of government. Government's job is to do this, this, this. this. No, government's job is to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Mm -hmm. Raise a standing army, uh, have a criminal civil justice system to keep order in society, protect its citizens. But we've turned to government now to do so many things that frankly it was never ever meant to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And and this is what happened. Our, Our founders understood where God is maximized in society, government will be minimized in society. They wanted a government that was going to be minimized so people would be free to serve God, not government. But mm-hmm. any society that becomes increasingly secularized, and that's what we're becoming, a secular society, what happens? God is minimized, then government becomes maximized to the point God is now government. Mm. And the ultimate expression of this, of course, is communism, where the people are completely not controlled by government because there is no God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're seeing, I mean, frightening 
uh, to watch what's happening in the halls of our government now, where people are openly espousing Marxist and communist ideas. And uh, those kind, those things are uh, tacitly, they're on the ballot, and people need to pay attention. I want to jump into some listener questions. We get some great questions in for you from listeners. Michelle in Georgia, this is a great question, Phil. You're going to love this. She said, we recently started attending a church that we love, teaching the Bible, speaking about what's going on in the culture. The spirit is moving. We just found out that they're Pentecostal. And they're really big into speaking in tongues. I'll be honest. It doesn't match what I've been taught in the past, including teaching the youth that everyone can speak in tongues, along with that being baptized in the Holy Spirit as a second event. Since being a believer, I have attended Baptist and Calvary Chapel churches. I'm not sure if we should run or if we should continue attending. I would love to hear Pastor Phil's encouragement in these two areas. Yeah. What I find most problematic about what she has shared is that they're teaching Everyone should speak in tongues, Heidi. Now, the in-house debate theologically has always been, uh, is, is tongues for today or did it cease, right? That's a, that's a healthy debate that Christians can disagree on uh, that I think we should hold loosely when it comes to the issue of tongues. It's what I would consider a second-tier issue. Yeah, not, not a salvation not, issue. It's not a salvation issue. It's not necessarily one. Uh, that I think we should divide on. I think Christians, regardless of how you feel about that, can worship together, work together for a common cause, the gospel. What is absolutely unbiblical is the idea that the sign of salvation is the gift of tongues, mm -hmm. or even the sign that you're filled with the Spirit is the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. uh, that is really problematic. To teach that everyone should be speaking in tongues is, is absolutely just... It's just not biblical. Mm -hmm. what, what the Bible teaches about spiritual gifts is that we are all uniquely and diversely gifted. Mm -hmm. So if tongues is for today, the implication is not everyone would have this gift, mm -hmm. even if some have the gift. To teach that everyone ought to have the gift is just absolutely completely unbiblical. Now, um, uh, I, 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 love, I love me some Pentecostal, all right? I really do. <laughs> I've been accused of being a little Bapticostal. I, I <laughs> don't mind that a bit, all right? Um, but there is a, there's an extremism alive today that says uh, the sign of being filled with the Spirit or the sign of being baptized in the Spirit is you will speak in tongues. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 9 tells us this. There are three gifts Paul names specifically, uh, being prophecy, the word of knowledge, and tongues. Now, verse 9 says, When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. So here's the big debate, theologically. Let's have a little Bible study, okay? He tells us these three spiritual gifts of the first century, the apostolic age, will be done away, or cease, when that which is perfect is come. Now, the big debate is what is that perfect thing Paul's talking about? Is it the full, complete revelation of the Word of God? Or is it, what some say, the second coming of Christ or the eternal state? So the best commentary on the Bible is always the Bible. All right? The Bible is a self-interpreting book. The word tetelion, the phrase in the Greek, that perfect, comes from the phrase in the Greek tetelion. You find that phrase only one other time in Scripture, and only one other time. It's James 1.25, that perfect law of liberty. Now, basic rules of Bible study. You interpret the unclear passage in view of the clear passage. So the context in 1 Corinthians 13.9 is unclear. What is that perfect Paul's talking about? We don't know. But you connect the dots to the one other time Paul uses that phrase. Or I'm sorry, James uses the phrase in James 1.25. That perfect law of liberty, clearly in the context here, is the written revelation of God's Word. So the implication here is Paul's teaching, when the full written revelation of God's Word has come, when that perfect has come, that which in part, or the training wheels of the early church, would be done away with, would no longer be needed. And so tongues is written in a way that Paul's saying at some point it's going to cease, it's no longer needed. Now, I'm going to hold this very loosely. Uh, I, I know too many Christians that God is using that are mature believers that love the Word of God that have the gift of tongues. 
But the biblical gift of tongues is the gift of languages. All right, so you see the gift in Acts chapter 2. As you had people all over the Roman world on the day of Pentecost hearing the gospel, the good news that the Messiah has come, that he's died for our sin, that he rose again, and they're speaking in other tongues. And people from all over the Roman world are hearing the gospel in their language. And so oftentimes when people refer to the biblical gift of tongues, it's something altogether different. It's never just gibberish. It's, it's never uh, just some language that nobody can understand. In fact, Paul is very clear in 1 Corinthians 14. To exercise the gift of tongues, there needs to be an interpreter. In 1 Corinthians 14, he says, not only should there be an interpreter if you exercise the gift of tongues, but he says no more than three at a time. He was dealing in the Corinthian church with unmounted chaos and confusion in their services with people trying to one-up each other. Uh, and this is what always happens when tongues, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 14, when it gets an undue emphasis and you put it on a pedestal above all the other spiritual gifts, suddenly now, man, if I don't speak in tongues, I'm a second-class Christian. Mm-hmm. I'll be less than. I, and, and, and so it creates a culture uh, in these religious systems of confusion and sometimes even condemnation. I know people in all sincerity have been taught, man, you have to speak in tongues if you want to be a spirit-filled Christian. And they've tried for years and prayed for years. And I met other people who just honestly told me, Pastor Phil, I just faked it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, was just, I was just in church where I faked it. So my issue would not be you're in a church that teaches tongues is for today. I'm going to hold that very loosely. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to separate with anybody over that one. But I would personally have to separate from a church that teaches this is the sign. This Mm -hmm. is the litmus test. Mm -hmm. You know, the big debate um, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is the baptism of the Spirit the same as the baptism in the Spirit? You guys, come on. Seriously? I think sometimes um, we're really debating semantics. What I know is this. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said, We've all been baptized by one spirit into one body. So it's not like you've got some Christians that have received the baptism and others that haven't. All right? He's writing to all of us saying, We've all been baptized by one spirit into one body. Romans 8 9 says, If we have not the spirit of God, we're none of his. So there's no such thing as a Christian that hasn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a second baptism of some kind? Um, I don't know that I'd put it in those terms. I can tell you when God called me to preach, something unique, something different happened. All right? Um, No, it it wasn't some um, weird esoteric moment. I can tell you that the Spirit of God filled me in a way he never had before to empower me to fulfill the calling God had placed on my life. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call that a second baptism, though. I would call that in some way, listen, it's never you getting more of the Spirit of God. It's always the Spirit of God getting more of you. Mm, It's good. And that's what happened to me. It's good. It's good. I think it's important, too, and I know, uh, well, I'm assuming that you would agree with me, I think just as it's easy for people to, you know, on the on the Pentecostal, everyone should be speaking in tongues side to demonize their brothers and sisters in Christ who either haven't experienced the gift or don't believe that it's for everyone or believe that that, that gift has ceased. It's also easy for the other side, right? Uh, who's you know, like you know? I grew up in a very, very traditional church in a Baptist church, and I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I heard people making fun of people who speaking in tongues, and that's not right either. No. And I think it doesn't. Neither of those two things reflects the heart of God, because I know, and I know you do too, uh, people on both sides of this debate who are following Christ with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and who love the Lord. And I think um, we, you know, we do our best to study God's Word and to understand there are lots of things in, this, in the spiritual realm that I don't understand, you know, yeah. and I don't think I will it's understand a, until I frankly, get to heaven. it's okay to sometimes say, I don't know. Yeah, I that's don't know. The, that's the most honest, and I would suggest even theological answer we can give sometimes. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I don't know. Some things will fully... I, I have a good friend. Look, I, I, I was taught... Man, 
Those who speak in tongues, that's demonic. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think so. Not always. It can be. Yep. Look, Jesus said, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, Mm -hmm. John chapter 4. So if you're trying to worship God in the spirit, but you're not deeply tied to the truth, you're making yourself susceptible to any spirit. 100%. That's just the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And everything God does, Satan counterfeits. He counterfeits everything. So there is a counterfeit gift of tongues, and there is a real gift of tongues. Um, I have a good friend. uh, I, I... certainly don't think he's under demonic influence he's a godly man he he i pray i pray in tongues like a comanche that's how he puts it <laughs> i think what he's saying is when he prays he doesn't always speak english okay <laughs> man i'm gonna hold that really loosely yeah. you know what i'm saying that, that mm-hmm. doesn't that doesn't rock my world at all and if you've got people what i what tell me if you i want to just this is what i think i hear you saying you're saying to this lady, listen, if you go to church and they speak in tongues, that's all right. Where you draw the line is when they say it is a requirement for salvation that you speak in tongues. That is where you draw the line. Is that or what that I'm hearing? everyone should. Or that everyone should, right. Because that's just not, clearly not the teaching of Scripture. It's a mm-hmm. spiritual gift. Paul's mm-hmm. very clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're uniquely and diversely gifted. That'd be like saying everybody should have... The gift of prophecy. Everybody right. should have the gift of teaching. Uh, everybody should have the gift of administration. Mm-hmm. And that's just, uh, Paul is very clear in 1 Corinthians 12. If all were the eye, where would be the smelling? Right. Uh, if everyone was the, the ear, you know, where, where would be the, the seeing? The, you know, mm-hmm. we don't all have the same gift for the same mm-hmm. reason there are different parts of your body that all do something differently. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've seen it all. I was raised... And what I would call a, it was just a dead church mm-hmm. that had right orthodoxy, right theology. Mm-hmm. They got the truth, I, but they I, missed I was the spirit raised, part. I was raised in a tradition that the, the Holy Trinity was not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was Father, Son, Holy Bible, okay? <laughs> 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 so that's where I come from. Sounds like we went to the same church I growing up. I, I feel like we so, did. <laughs> I, I love, though, the way Jim Cimbala puts it, man I've met and uh, certainly consider a friend, mm-hmm. author of Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. That's I a think great book. Yeah. Best quote ever, okay? If all we have is the Spirit of God, we blow up. If all we have is the Word of God, we dry up. But mm-hmm. if we have both of them, we grow up. Ah, it's good. Man, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, Fresh I Wind, think, Fresh Fire. I should read that yeah, again. It's been a long yeah. time. It, here's the point. If all you have is the Word of God, but you don't have any of us on the Spirit of God, and it's just academic. Mm-hmm. If on the other hand, all the emphasis on the Spirit of God, but you're not deeply tied to the Word of God, mm-hmm. man, this can lead you all kinds of places. First Timothy four yeah. one: Test the spirits, whether they yeah. be of God. Mm-hmm. You can't test the spirit, whether or not it's the Spirit of God, if you're not deeply filtering everything through the Word of God. Mm-hmm. By the way, the Book of Acts. This is where a lot of them go to. In the book of Acts, because everyone seems to speak in tongues in the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. Acts is a transitional book. Acts was written for church history. It was not written for church theology. We get our theology specifically from the epistles written to the church. Now, it's mm-hmm. not that there's no theology in the book of Acts. Of course there is. But primarily, why is it written? It's written to record the Acts mm-hmm. of the early church. Mm-hmm. So it's primarily a book of history. The it's Acts an, of the Apostles. There oh. you go. So what you see in the book of Acts, listen, guys, it is primarily descriptive. It is not written to be prescriptive. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's describing, but not prescribing. It's describing what happened in these moments in time, but not prescribing necessarily what ought to happen every time. Yeah, it's good. It's good. And I'm hoping, you know, that the that the. The person who wrote in with this question is going to go before the Lord and say, Father, show me, you know, yeah. show me, show me, because uh, yeah. it's it's more important now than ever. But I got another. This is a crazy question. We're having all kinds of fun today. Uh, Halloween was yesterday, so it's over now. You know, people ask me every year to jump into the Halloween debate. I hate the Halloween debate. I'll just be super honest. You may not have heard this from me, Phil, but my listeners have for years and years and years. Uh, I grew up trick-or-treating with my granddad, and my grandparents were, you know, he was a pastor. My grandparents loved the Lord. My grandmother also had this macabre sense of humor, and she loved to scare the living daylights out of us. (laughs) She absolutely loved it. I remember one time when I was in, I want to say I was in junior high, and I came home from school, 
And I went downstairs and it was it was probably Halloween or pretty darn close to it because grandma thought it was great, right? She just had so much fun. I, I opened the door to my brother's bedroom and she had rigged a pulley to a dummy in, in a, a box that she made into a coffin. So when I opened the door, this thing like sits up and goes, ah, and I scared, I mean, she scared me to death and grandma thought that was the funniest <laughs> thing on the face of the earth. So that's how I grew up. And so we didn't really have any, any problem with Halloween or trick or treating, but I will tell you as an adult now, I mean, to me, it has taken on such even more in people say, well, it's always been dark. Well, I feel like it's even darker now than it's ever been. I mean, the images that you see, you go into Home Depot this time of year and you got these 12 foot, you know, goblins that are just, you know, holding a human head in their hand and all kinds of craziness. And uh, my, my grandparents would have said, and we did this growing up, and actually Jay and I have done this a lot with our kids when they were younger, we used it as an opportunity to meet our neighbors. It was like the one day of the, of the year when people would actually knock on your door and you could say, hey, my name's Heidi, and these are my kids, and that's how we met our neighbors. So that is a, a whole other you know, can of worms. This year I haven't talked about Halloween at all uh, because I've been so busy with the elections that are happening, and I felt like it was more important. But this woman wrote in, and I want to read it. She said she's the mother of a three-year-old. I grew up in a very lukewarm home when it comes to Christianity. There are so many things in our culture that are not God-honoring. My husband is worried that I might be too legalistic when it comes to not celebrating Halloween and not letting him watch. I'm, I think she's talking about her son and maybe not her husband here. Not letting him watch the cartoons that his cousins and peers want him to watch. I feel like this is coming from our church as well. How can I guard myself from legalism? I don't want my child to be driven away from Christ by me being too strict. I love the heart of this mother. No doubt for her mm-hmm. son. And Absolutely. I just want to say, wow, precious. I mean, this is an well anonymous done. listener, but yeah. I wish we're going to call her Julie. Julie, mm-hmm. good on you. I mean, I'm really proud yeah. of this mom because I think she's being Me discerning. Me too. Yeah. So the classic definition of legalism is we draw a fence around the sin and then call it a sin to cross the fence. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't think this good. is I'm, what she's... You need to write a book yeah. like Philisms yeah. and we need it. Yeah. Uh, so, or look at, or you have a personal conviction that now you made into a doctrine, and if it's doctrine, it ought to apply to everybody the way it applies to me, mm-hmm. right? So legalism is, uh, the book of Galatians was written for this very reason. Uh, the Galatians were being taught by false teachers that everyone has to be circumcised to be a Christian. And of course, Paul's teaching that, wait a minute, that was under the law, that is not a condition for your salvation. Now, if you have a personal conviction that you should be circumcised, nothing wrong with it, you're free. But don't apply that personal conviction and say everybody ought to feel mm-hmm. the way you do about it, or mm-hmm. one, you're not a Christian, or two, you're just not a very good Christian. Mm-hmm. That's the nature now of legalism. And we're so hard on each other. It, it is, r- seriously. So you draw a fence around the sin, not because it's wisdom, but now you're calling it a sin to cross the fence. So mm-hmm. I don't think she's being legalistic. I, I, look, I'm not going to say you're sinful if in some way uh, you take your kids trick-or-treating. My mm-hmm. parents, like yours, mm-hmm. again, generational thing, they, uh, yeah. wouldn't, they wouldn't let us dress up like <laughs> ghosts or witches <laughs> right. or goblins, but yeah. you know, I usually was a hobo, okay? It was easy. <laughs> it was put the on, easy one. Put on that some was, old clothes. That was the ticket to a whole bunch of candy. An old right? hat, your yeah. grandpa's overalls, and yeah, yeah. take Dirty some mascara. Your face. You, know, you got freckles now, okay, now you're a hobo. <laughs> Listen, somehow I still grew up to love Jesus. Yeah. And um, I didn't grow up to be a devil worshiper, okay? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm trying to, uh, now Now what I know now, Heidi, I would be much more cautious. That's how I feel, yeah. And that's what's, yeah. it's not saying somebody is sinful mm-hmm. if you take your child trick-or-treating. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be legalistic. It's just mm-hmm. saying, is this how, is this wise? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think children should be given opportunity if they, you know, we would let our kids and when they were young go to grandma and grandpa's mm-hmm. and they would put on a costume, usually a bunny, a tiger and a lion. That was my three <laughs> kids. My daughter was the bunny. Uh, one of my boys was a lion. This is when they're like, you know, pre-K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, one, and they had all kinds of fun. We would paint the whiskers on them. So <laughs> there's still a sense of we get to do something fun. All my friends are getting to do yeah. something fun. This is when kids, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers or mothers, provoke not your children to 
rebellion, mm -hmm. anger, but raise them up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. What provokes a child to rebellion is when we impose on them rules and regulations that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In their mind, how can it be wrong to put on a lion costume and go to grandma and grandpa's mm -hmm. and get candy? All mm -hmm. my friends are going house to house Mm -hmm. dressed up like something why can't I do that mm -hmm. so I think there's a way that we can let our kids have fun let kids be kids mm -hmm. but not in any way um, subject them to something that is Halloween is demonic the nature yeah. of Halloween is satanic yeah and uh, so um, we don't want to give Ephesians 5 don't give place to the devil um, but I think there's a way that you know, because we live in the culture we do that, that we can still let our kids have fun mm -hmm. and enjoy that season and yeah. do it in a way that still God is glorified and doesn't expose them to. Look, it's not simply a metaphor. It's darkness. It is absolutely true. And, and I yeah. think we see it more in your face now than we've ever seen it. Uh, the enemy is not not hiding at all. And I, I, you know, I was a cop back in the 90s. This might be a relevant story. So I'm a cop back in the 90s in Kansas City. We get called to a domestic violence call around this time of year. It's Halloween season. And we go into this house. Um, we go to the basement. This man has bludgeoned his wife to death with a mm. two by four. I'm sorry mm. to be graphic. Mm. It's a horrible, horrible scene. We start poking around this house. It turns out they are they're Wiccans or something like that. Mm -hmm. They have brochures that they are disseminating. They've been mailing out, and it was it was a Wiccan witchcraft type of literature, and they're basically inviting other Wiccans and witches uh, to what amounts to a pagan holiday, a pagan festival. And here was the heading of their invite: um, "Tis the season." Mm. Okay. Uh, we start making our way around the house. There is uh, books everywhere on spells, casting spells. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we make our way up to the next floor, finally make our way. There's a, there's a pagan altar in the attic, Heidi, with hand-painted, hand-drawn pictures on the walls of what can only be described as demonic beings. Mm. There are names written in a language we never did figure out what the writing was. The clearly names are on the pictures. These are demonic beings on the walls. They're gods or whoever they were. Mm -hmm. And there's an altar in the middle of this room uh, where they had been burning incense to these pagan deities. Now, I'm only sharing this to say this isn't just some fun. It's real. It's, this is real. Yeah. And to, for some people, it's as real to the, it's a religious holiday. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's not simply to make, you know, have fun and go to haunted houses and dress up like you're a ghost or a witch or a goblin and, and scare people because it's, it's, it's worth a laugh. For them, it's a religious holiday, mm -hmm. Halloween is. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's as real to them as Christmas is to us in terms of there's, we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. They're celebrating something altogether different. Mm hmm yeah, it's true. And I and I, you know, every year we hear horrific stories. I mean, that's a, a that's a horrific story. And every year, you know, we're reminded all you got to do, like I said, all you got to do is go to Home Depot. This is not from the Lord. This is not good stuff. And I think parents need to use discernment. They need to use wisdom. But I agree with you. You know, if your kids want to dress up and they want to be a, you know, a lion, a tiger and a bear and go to grandma's and go, get some candy at the door. Okay. I might even speak into yeah, she's she's not letting her her kids watch some cartoons. I wouldn't let my kids watch a number of cartoons. Oh, goodness. Me either. Because right. the, the message in them is very clear. It's uh, cartoons can be a place of indoctrination. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, More just now than ever. Or, or, or low-key perversion. Mm -hmm. And my adult children now, we kind of laugh about it, you know, kind of low-key. Oh, Dad, you guys. Well, well wait. They, oh, when, they have kid, when they have kids, they will feel the same way about it. <laughs> so true that's so true 100 yeah there are cartoons they can watch yeah that are generally innocent yeah 
that you can walk out of the room and not worry about what they're going to learn. Well, you used to watch, you know what? I mean, we're dating ourselves, but we used to watch, you know, Daffy Duck and, you know, Bugs Bunny and it, the stuff kids are watching now. I'm sorry, but we're talking Homer about. Homer Simpson is not a cartoon. Right. Longest, right? <laughs> longest running sitcom in America, by the way. Right. Yeah, Bart Simpson, that was <laughs> never on the watch list. I don't care if it's a cartoon or not. Nope. I'll even make a confession, Heidi. <laughs> I'll make a confession. I would never let my kids watch SpongeBob SquarePants. Dude, I, just, I didn't either. You know why? Because he was so disrespectful. It just drove <laughs> exactly. me up That's a what tree. I'm saying. The disrespect. I Do was I like, want oh, my no. kids to learn? I mean, they're going to figure that out on their own. I don't yep. really want to. Yep. And do your yeah. kids give you a hard time about it? Oh, yeah. Kind oh, of mine do, too. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm like, listen, you survived. You didn't need SpongeBob. You did, yeah. Somehow you're, you're, they survived. They somehow you survived. But I'll tell you what, the, the, the cartoons our kids are talking about now, I mean, it's it's uh, homosexuality, it's kids changing genders, it's all kinds of stuff. And uh, the parents today, I mean, one of the reasons I so appreciate this last question is that she's trying to keep an eye out because parents today are dealing with stuff that my generation and your generation of parents, young parents, we didn't even see coming. I mean, there's no way you could knock me over for the feather when I was, you know, parenting uh, young children at 25, 26, 30 years old. If you would have said to me, there's going to be cartoons piped into our living room someday and kids are going to be talking openly about homosexuality. You got girls, girls kissing girls in cartoons today. It is not the same thing. Parents absolutely need to be yeah, vigilant. Some cartoons should just be off the list. Now, come on. Um, Lion King, when my kids were young. I don't know if Lion King is still a thing or not. Oh, so. Savannah. Yeah. Hey, man, was that 95, 93, now, somewhere in there? Now, look at the themes that Disney has inserted. So Come with on. Lion, with Lion King, you remember there's one scene where, you know, little Simba is looking up at the stars with mm -hmm. Big Daddy Simba. James Earl Jones up there. There you go. Yeah, those are the, the kings from the past are up yeah. there, right? Simba, so, remember so who here's, you are. But here's the I didn't I didn't say kids we can't watch this now. These are teaching moments. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So hey now kids I got you know that's not true. What you just heard is not true. The stars are not people from right. the past. <laughs> that's right. You know, um so um, you know, I, I think legalism says we're never gonna watch anything. Yeah, yeah. And kid kids kids can start to see through that. It mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense. Some things, yeah, they shouldn't watch. Some things you shouldn't watch. Mm -hmm. Some things Come parents on. shouldn't watch. Come on. Not just kids. Right. <laughs> the eyes are the window to the soul. Come on. Uh, but some things, listen, use them as teaching moments. Yeah. To They can still enjoy a movie, but you're not going to let them hear something. That's just not true. Yeah. You're gonna use yeah. It you don't want that lie to, to take them. root in their heart. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you an opportunity. And I, I agree with you. I think we, you know, we allow these moments to be teaching moments. We're still wise and we're, we shelter our kids. And we know, you know, I'm a huge fan, as you well know, of sheltering children. We care more about sheltering tomato plants in this country than we do about sheltering children. There are some things, lots of things uh, in the world right now that little ones are not ready for. And yet they're being exposed to these ideas every day at our public library, certainly in our public schools, absolutely on our television sets. Uh, what's coming down from Disney right now is not what was coming down from Disney when you and I were growing up. And, you know, I guess we've fallen into that category. Like, it was so much better. Those are the good old days. Well, I recognize there was evil then, too. It's a different kind of evil that we're dealing with now. Uh, it's a different generation, right? And so parents need to be vigilant. So I so appreciate it. I know uh, that you do, too. We had one more question, but we're out of time. So we'll get that next time you're on. Pastor Phil Hopper. Uh, I so appreciate you. Thank you for coming on, just sharing that seasoned wisdom from God's word. If people want to find you, where's the best way for them to do that? Livingproof.co is our church website. You can find my email on there if they ever want to email me. I'm on Instagram and Facebook as well, Heidi. Livingproof.co. I'm going to be out there for Mother's Day this year. Really looking forward to it. We've had Can't people wait. writing in to ask about that. And uh, just love the ministry that you guys got going on out there. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It's always a joy. Thanks, Heidi. You're so welcome. If you guys want more information on my guest today, you know how to do it. You can submit a question to Pastor Phil by going to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash mailbox Monday, and you will see that he's got his own very own little tab in there. So please put your questions in there. We love to answer them. And uh, we want to hear what's on your heart. So thank you guys for writing in. Get out there and vote, you guys. Get out there and vote. And uh, keep praying for our nation. And I'll see you right back here again at the intersection of faith and culture.